Hi, I'm John DeArmo with the Gokio Valley Sword Group, and today we're talking about cuts and thrusts. When do you want to use them, and really what is their difference, right? So, uh, in one of the recent videos, we talked about uh, efficiency and how thrusts are incredibly efficient. They move along a single linear axis, uh, typically, and uh, they're hard to see. You know, they're just really direct, really good. Um, but we don't really use a lot of them. Or rather, uh, we don't tend to start off movements with them. I mean, obviously, Sasen is the exception to that. But by and large, we're not out here sitting in Chudon and just thrusting at the guy. Right? Most of the time, we're cutting. Now, some people uh, have this idea that because the Japanese sword has that curvature to it, it is a poor thrusting sword, and that perhaps the European sword, with its uh, more balanced uh, architecture, is superior to thrusting. Um, and that's, that's why. Right? The weapon's not good for thrusting, and so the Japanese just don't thrust, right? It's good for cutting, because it's got the curve, and the curve cuts more, and yada yada yada. Um, yeah, that's, that is not why. <laughs> that, is, that is not why at all. And, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, the Japanese sword does a perfectly fine job thrusting. Um, when you consider uh, that most katana are as thick as a rondel, uh, a dagger used specifically uh, in armored fighting uh, to penetrate mail and sometimes plate. Uh, the, the idea that the Japanese sword is not good for thrusting is it's ludicrous. It's, it's, it's internet memedom. Don't fall for it. Use your common sense, right? Would you want to be poked by it? Can you poke something with it? Poke some tatami, right? You'll form an educated opinion. <clears throat> but that leaves the question, like, okay, 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 we gotcha, it's good for thrusting, you can back off. Why don't they thrust more often? Well, they do thrust a lot, right? The only thing is, we don't usually thrust in uh, our partnered work with people because thrusts are dangerous, right? Uh, you're, you're really concentrating a lot of power right at that tip. And even with uh, the Fukuro Shinai, or even the modern uh, sort of Kendo Shinai, uh, it's very easy to hurt somebody with thrust. Um, you know, because that's kind of the point, right? <laughs> um, We don't thrust where people can easily see, is kind of the other side of this. So, um, if we think about, say, rapier fighting, right? Fighting with an FA or a foil or whatever. They have a long guard, and the work is predominantly thrusting. And there becomes this sort of uh, dueling interplay between who can thrust better, right? This type of interaction is uh, it's good in its context, and that context is in civilian dueling. In other words, if I'm only fighting one dude, then I can take the time to do this kind of work because it is time consuming, which seems weird because if the thrust takes less time to throw, you'd think that like, well, if I throw one attack and it costs me half the time, then I can throw two attacks at the same time it takes to do one cut, you know, if an attack, if 
you know, an altercation takes five attacks to win on average, it's just a random number, then, you know, the thrusting should be half as fast, right? And so they should be half as long. Well, that's just not how it turns out. Um, when, when you enter this kind of uh, dueling, one-on-one -on -one mindset, your work becomes much more dependent on your sort of technical acumen, the number of tricks in your toolbox, um, and uh, to an equal degree, your personal cunning. And that's great. Right? Get in the, the mind of the dude you're working, you know, really just right? get him in, in second or third time. But for uh, work like Hyoho and work like a lot of the Japanese, most basically all the Japanese Koryu, uh, they were not really designed to uh, excel in one on one dueling. Right? Of course, dueling happened. The individual dueling happened in mass amounts, just like everywhere else in the world. Um, but by and large, Japanese sword work is built for uh, large group warfare. Right? It's about how can I resolve this person in the least amount of time? with the least amount of training, with the m most repeatability amongst a set of students, right? To that end, spending a lot of time making attacks that can be easily defended, which thrusts from any kind of forward guard, shoot on or otherwise, are easy to defend, right? Because all you have to do is also come out in the forward guard. Now, all the time they take to attack you, boop, you use that efficiency of the center, and you can deflect them. Now, if you thrust and counter, they can deflect you with just as much ease. Um, obviously, each style has their own methods and, and, and tactical work to build onto this to give them their, their super work that's undefeatable. Um, but we're not going to go into that, obviously. We just want to hit it with the broad strokes, which is that from the Japanese perspective of battlefield fighting, of fighting in armor, um, thrusts are just not widely employed as opening movements, as uh, opening movements in sequence, because they're easy to defeat. Um, so think about armor, and we're gonna we're gonna leave the whole armor penetration thing out of it for right now. If you're thrusting, right, the part that's gonna contact your opponent is the tip. Pretty simple, right? That means the space that you're going to contact the opponent, the space that you can effectively hit them, is the tip, right? Now, unarmored, yeah you're going to be able to hit anywhere that you can manage to hit and have it do some level of damage, right? Even when the opponent is moving, right? They're moving, you're moving, right? Yeah, you hit them. Even if it's not where you perfectly wanted, right? You're still going to do something, right? Armor changes this equation completely because now, oh, you know, I was aiming for the eye, right, or whatever, and they turn their head slightly, boom, and you've just got nothing but kobuto, no, nothing but, but helmet, you know, let alone if they're stepping, if they're really employing that, that, that sore as a shield. It becomes very, very difficult to hit somebody with a thrust when they have time to respond to it. So, if we don't throw thrusts then, when do we throw them? Almost always after our cuts. In other words, we'll cut. Now, if we're cutting, we're assuming, if you're cutting well, 
that they're in range to be hit, which means, let's say they move out of range, right? But the distance that I am making that thrust in is so much smaller than it would be in a dueling context. In a dueling context, our distance is far, our range is far, we're, you know, just at incredible lengths trying to go dive in, pull back, dive in, pull back to get the person. And that time is time that they have to perceive and time that they have to uh, answer our work. Whereas when we throw it after a cut, there's almost no time to resolve it. Um, and this is not an idea that is specific to Japanese work. Uh, if you look at uh, German fencing, uh, the Zornhorn, right? The, the thrust of wrath. Right after that Zornhau, the cut of wrath, boom, boom, they follow it right with that thrust. Boom, boom, just like we do. Because it is work that makes sense for the context that it was developed in, right? So, what about cuts? You know, if cuts are so great and grand, then why, when we switched over to dueling context, are they uh, used to a uh, slightly lesser degree, right? Well, it has to do with the nature, right? When I'm working a dude, and I want to be sure that I'm going to hit him, I want the smallest margin of error. In other words, I want to have the likelihood that I'm going to hit him be the highest. Now, with the thrust we talked about, I'm damaging with this, and so that is my kind of target window for hitting something, irregardless of what they're doing or how they're they're moving and trying to protect themselves. With a cut, it's different, right? I'm working with my Monouchi. Now I not only have a large sort of swath, right? But that swath is moving in an arc, which means I'm hitting everything here to here and in that wide, right? And as long as I can put a line like that somewhere through them, I'm going to hit them, right? Again, not taking into account any other shimmy shimmy nonsense. So my likelihood of hitting is much higher, right? But in the context of armor, this is important. Because even if I'm hitting them with the cut, with the intention to cut them, many times I'm not just going to cut them. I'm doing other things as well. I might be gathering their weapon. I might be gathering their body. I might be using this as a sort of feeler gauge as I'm cutting and displacing my body out of the way to change my angle of force, boom, to have an effect on their, their comportment, on their posture, on their combine, boom. Right? So the cut is like the, the, the jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none kind of thing, whereas the thrust is that, that master of one. It does one thing really, really well, which is not to say that you, you, can't, uh, you can't displace their work as you thrust, because you certainly can. Um, you're going to have a hard time throwing somebody with a thrust, you're going to have a hard time positioning somebody into their opponent or into uh, their buddies or moving them into uh, easy access for your buddies with the thrust, with anything more than just the, the psychological effect of being attacked. Um, can't really wrestle a person with a thrust, right? Um, so why, do they, why are they used less in dueling? Well... Because there's a lot less of this, I'm moving people around. That happens in larger scale fighting. There is little to no armor. So I'm not concerned about, oh, well, 
if I don't hit a meaningful target, right? Like, I go out for that joint, and they, they just pull that kote into it, and I catch the uh, crossbars or the kasari or whatever they happen to be wearing as armor, right? I can still do work. I can still bully them and manipulate and wrestle with them, right? When we're not wearing armor, it's not an issue so much, right? Because all of that versatility comes at the cost of time. And it's that time, like we talked about in the efficiency video, of moving through the space. So, this is not to say that they're not cutting methods in dueling. Um, certainly we can look at any classic saber work uh, and see that there clearly are, but the way the cuts are thrown changes the primary targets of where the cuts are thrown and sort of uh, which ones are prioritized changes to help minimize that distance cost while maximizing their ability to displace and control the opponent's weapon, right? Because again, dueling takes place at a further distance than where we typically fight at when we're working armor, when we're working uh, more than one person. Uh, again, because of time constraints, right? In an ideal world, our distance would be far, right? Far distance uh, greatly advantages the person with greater technical skill. You have more tricks, you have more ways to uh, protect yourself and create opportunity, you have more ways to attack without allowing opportunity when your technical work is greater. But it comes at the cost of time, right? Time to position, time to move in and move back, time to be unaffected by Bob and George and Fred and everybody else who's on the battlefield doing their own work. Because it's not like they're, oh, the samurai are fighting. We will not interfere. No, it's like, oh, look, you're fighting my friend. <laughs> yep, next. Right? And you work in coordinated groups to take down <laughs> people. And you just cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them. And just whiffle your way through it. Right? So, um, hopefully this has caused uh, more understanding than confusion. That's... <laughs> Um, but let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go a little bit deeper. So, let's say you're working. When should you thrust? When should you cut? Well, uh, if you're in kata, you should do what the kata says. <laughs> if you're in um, randori or, or, or whatever it is, some kind of sparring, then, well, it depends, right? What are you working on in your sparring? Because sparring is training. Uh, sparring is not like... Uh, <sighs> sparring is not only a way to gauge your ability. Right? A lot of people are like, oh, well I can beat Bob and Fred, so I'm this good, but I can't beat George or Sue because they're that good. So I'm... This is my relative skill level. This is my place in the... The, the, the sword group pack, so to speak. Uh, and the higher I get, the more I can kind of uh, say what I want and people will have to listen to it because I have authority now, kind of thing. Um, gauging yourself with sparring is very useful. It's good. It's where you test your work and go, did that work, did it not, right? But the key to sparring, uh, to sparring and using it as a tool for your personal growth and not just the growth of your ego, is that came off a little snide, I didn't mean it to be, uh, is to work on your work, right? So if you've spent all class uh, working on Ukenagashi, then in sparring, go, okay, you know, I'm still gonna keep that sort of Zanshin Nebula of possibility, but I am going to 
kind of pull Okanagashi closer. So it's in my side. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it just a little bit. Like, not something I would do in a fight, but it's something I'm doing because sparring is training, and training is training on a fight. Always. Right? And so, when I have an opportunity, it's like, oh, well, I could do this or that. I'll preference the work that I was practicing in class, or the work that I've been struggling with or the work that uh, I'm unsure of, right? Like, ah, uh, you know, that, that technique looks really hokey. I don't know if it's going to work. And you just try it, right? If Because, as always, you try and disprove yourself. If you think, oh, this work is this, is, this is the greatest piece of work ever, then you try and prove that it's not. If you think, ah, oh, this work looks really shady and that's not going to work, then you try and prove that it does work, right? This is how you'll come to a better sense of reality, right? <laughs> of, of what's really going on in terms of how your work is applied on other people. Um, yeah. So, it depends, right? It's a very inconvenient answer. Um, if somebody's fighting far away, you know, Usually, I'll use cuts. Even if uh, my intent is to come in hard on them rather than to wait for them to come to me, I'll tend to use cuts. When the work is close, then I still try and use cuts, right? Because for me, and this is a personal taste, I prefer being adaptable to being specialized. Right? And that's, it's a preference born out of both my natural inclination and my experience. Other people are going to have uh, different opinions. They're going to have different ideas in their own work. And they might think, no, I'm going to specialize in, in this one thing. And I'm going to become so good. I'm going to master this one thing so much that I am able to apply it to any situation. And if they can do it, if their uh, inclination, their constitution is such that it allows them, then they should, right? This is not uh, the great Hema, uh, the great Koryu, the great martial gods are not going to come down and go, oh, you did not do it how we prescribed, right? What matters is, does it work? Does it work for you, right? Does it work against people? who don't want it to work on them, right? When you, when you get this as one whole thing, does it work? Then uh, the rest doesn't matter so much. You know, we can argue about minutia, right? Oh, well, it's better to step this way because of reason A, or it's better to step this way because of reason B, or whatever. But once it works, really, can I make it work better? Is there a way of making it more efficient? You know, that becomes kind of the next. Because lots of people do work that works, but um, you can always make it better. There's, there's not an end. Um, so don't get complacent, right? Mediocrity is uh, the greatest sin, of course. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. It's uh, pretty clear, I feel. As always, if you want to understand this work, you have to pick up a sword and go train.